Good afternoon, DEF CON. How's it going? <laughs> I'm tired, that's all right. Um, so this is generating ROP payloads from numbers. So please join me in welcoming Alexander Monager. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for attending. So basically today um, I'll be talking about return-oriented programming and how, how to generate payloads using numbers. Um, so a little bit about me first. Um, I work for Cisco Systems in the UK. Uh, I'm a security engineer in um, the Cloud Web Security Business Unit, which is basically just a big cloud proxy, um, which has not got nothing to do about with what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Personally, I'm most interested about you know bits and bytes and low-level stuff, and um, and the usual disclaimer: the research was done on my own time, and they do not reflect the opinions of my employer or they just myself. You can't hear me? Okay, sorry. All right, is it better? Okay, so basically, I'll go through um, a brief uh, ROP overview. So, what is it? Why do we use it? And why has it kind of become essential today? Um, the automation, basically, of the ROP payload generation. Why do we want to do that or not? And what are the challenges with it? Then I'll go into a little bit of, um, so the core of the subject, which is, which I've called number stitching, which is basically uh, a possibly new way to generate ROP payloads from, from numbers instead of from strings. Um, so I'll go through, you know, the goal, what, I'm, what was I trying to achieve, you know, why, why I did it. Um, how, how I found the gadgets and basically the core of the problem which is the coin change problem which uh, I'll get back to later. Um, and then I'll have a quick, uh, quick chat about you know, the pros, the cons, um, the tooling that I'm releasing and, uh, and any future work. Okay, so I'll, I'll have a very br brief uh, introduction uh, about ROP, just so that um, I'm sure that everybody understands what it is. So basically, you know, before in the old days, you could just uh, attack, you know, exploit a vulnerability using, you know, just a bunch of shell code, and you could just execute it anywhere. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, nowadays, this, this, you can't do this anymore, right? You can't execute shell code in memory just like that. So. You know, historically, we got to a point where we, we got to return on into programming, which is basically instead of executing stuff through a shell code, um, use the target binary to execute code for you. So this means that you're not executing code yourself, you're asking your target basically to do it for you. All right? Um, so basically, Um, I'll just uh, come a bit back on basically what I wanted to achieve also. So basically what I wanted to achieve was uh, to only use gadgets from the compiler or libc stubs. So as I was saying basically uh, when you look for gadgets and instructions you're going to get your program to, 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 to use them. And so what I wanted to do is take it a bit a level further and abstract it a bit more and basically be able to use instructions generated by the compiler or by libc to, attack, to exploit the vulnerability. Um, and so I'll, I'll try and generate the payloads basically um, as usual putting them in memory and using them. So coming back to my ROP overview, um, so we know that we want to basically reuse instructions from the target binary in order to bypass uh, ASLR and XORW. So why we use ROP basically is just that we don't have a choice basically. The memory protections have got much better, um, we can't do without it and so we use it. The level of complexity is much higher, so if we could avoid it, it would be nice, but, but, um, but we can't basically. Um, it maintains control um, flow using the stack pointer and not the instruction pointer. I, I won't go into the details, but basically uh, this is how you maintain uh, control over the flow of the program. And ROP is, is, is multi-staged more or less by design. It's that you've got to have a first stage which is going to be using the, the instructions from your target binary to generate a payload for you, right? So that payload you're going to put it on a, on a custom stack you're going to create within the program. So your idea is, okay, let's take a tiny piece of the program and put some instructions there which I'm going to execute later. So that's your, 
your, your stage zero, the first, fa first phase basically, which is grab some stuff, put it in a zone in memory, and when you're finished doing that, change the control flow and execute that later. And as I said, it's more or less the only way around um, today's OS protections. Um, you know, if you look at all the IE exploits and all that stuff which happened in 2013, um, they all use ROP uh, to evade all those memory protections. So just a bit of vocabulary. Um, what is called uh, a gadget basically is just a useful instruction inside the target binary. So it's going to be a, a very small piece of um, assembly with a return instruction at the end. So that is what is you're going to call to execute code. How do you find them basically is that you you go over your binary, you look for every return instruction which is uh, 0xc3 and you disassemble backwards from that and that will give you basically what you can work with. So to do that there are many good tools available, ROP gadget, ROP me, which basically just go, you know, go over binary, will give you what gadgets you can use to, to attack it. And obviously the number of, of gadgets you can find in a binary is completely dependent within on the size of the binary. So if it's huge, you've got a big chance of finding, you know, a lot of, bi a lot of gadgets you can use. If it's really small, obviously you've got much less and it becomes much harder. So once you've done your stage zero, you've, you, you know, you've built your fake frame, your fake stack frame basically in, uh, in memory. Uh, you want to transfer control to that payload because that's what you want to execute, right? You want to, you want to get a shell or get whatever you want. Um, so shifting control from, from the current control flow into your stack frame is called uh, stack pivoting basically. And it's, it's a way of redirecting control flow so that you basically get then uh, your code to run once you've built it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, automating the payload generation, which is um, which is basically how from a program can I take bits of memory and put them, create that fake stack, which I will later execute. So this is the classical approach of what happens: is that you find you know a bunch of bytes in memory. Um, so the bytes you're looking for are obviously your shellcode bytes, right? So you've got a shellcode you're going to start from or, or something you want to achieve, a bunch of function calls you want to call and you're going to look for those bytes in memory and copy them over to a stack you control. Once you've done that, you get execution on that stack. So to achieve that, you use, um, you're going to look for some particular gadgets which is a move gadget. So you're going to try and move something from a register you control to a zone in memory you control. Or you can use a bunch of functions um, if they are exported by the target binary, which is not always the case. So you've got a bunch of potential problems in this. It's that you're counting basically on the avail availability of a move gadget. Um, in real world, you've generally got it. So in big programs, it's, it's not a problem. Um, it can require some got dereferencing, which I won't speak too much about, but that's if you want to get basically uh, your call a particular function. And also you're expecting some bytes to be available in memory. So typically in shellcode you're going to look for 0x80 for, for your interrupt number. And so you're expecting that number to be in memory because otherwise you're not going to be able to build your shellcode. Um, if that number is not there, it generally requires some manual work to get the missing bytes. All right, so if we look at a, at a shell code here which, uh, which I took, um, basically you can see that if I look for, you know, the bytes 73, 68, you know, I can find them in the program so that's nice. I can find those two bytes which are, you know, part of my shell code and I'm going to be able to use them. If I look for something different, um, basically, for example, 68, 2F, I don't find that in the program, right? So that means I'm going to have to do some manual work, manipulating some bytes to get, to get that. So back to the move gadget, basically. Very small binaries do not tend to have many move gadgets. Um, so it means that the automation of the payload is, is complicated. And in the case of um, this particular gadget I'm showing, um, you've got a problem sometimes with null bytes and basically it also needs some, some extra work to get rid of them. Okay, so here I'm going to introduce number stitching which is basically, <coughs> I was asking myself the question, is it possible to exploit a hello world type vulnerability 
with, all, with most memory protections um, enabled, right? I won't consider stack canaries and all that in, the, in this talk. But basically, you know, a gross programming mistake, you copy, you know, a user supplied argument with string copy and you get a buffer overflow or something like that. Is it exploitable with everything enabled? And also I was wondering, can I exploit this independently of what the program does, right? Using only the compiler or libc stubs. <coughs> so in other words, is it's like, is it possible to not rely at all on the target binary to generate a, a rock payload? So I'll go through a bit like how a program is built and you know how it's linked and what happens and, and we'll see what we get what we get. So basically all the all the following of this talk is going to be based on the gadgets I've been able to find here. It, basically all the other stuff was done uh, due to the gadgets which were made available to me. So if you just take a hello world, right, and compile it, so what happens, right? If you look at what, what your program actually contains, you see there's a whole bunch of other functions which you did not intend to be there. So, you know, the start, you've got libc, csu finny, and all that stuff. So where does that come from and can you use that? So if you look basically at link time at what happens, um, the linker will call libc.so. So you'd think that it's a dynamic library, but it's actually not. It's a script. And basically that script has got a, has got a static library in it. So meaning that when you compile your program against libc, you're going to have most of your functions dynamically linked, but also going to have a subset of those which are statically linked into your binary. So if you look at that, um, there's quite a few functions in there um, which could, you could possibly use, right? So all this basically is if you use it, it will be statically linked into your program, meaning that, you know, those gadgets will be at fixed um, addresses if PIE is, is not enabled. So the problem I had is that those functions, they're not always used. Um, they depend on, you know, various compilation options and linking options. And anyway, I just looked for gadget through them and I couldn't find anything useful, right? So I think it's, it's good also to say that, you know, what, what you weren't able to achieve. So basically looking for gadgets in that completely failed and I wasn't able to, to achieve anything. So basically I went back to my binary and said, all right, is there anything else um, which is added which I could use? And so basically I, I looked at the binary and there's, there's a bunch of, of functions which are added by GCC in some cases. So they've got no symbols um, attached to them so it's, it's kind of hard to figure out what they do but they're just a bunch of anonymous functions which are inserted into your program. So if you look at the disassembly of your program, you'll see that there's some functions where there's no symbols associated and they're just there basically. Um, those, pro those functions seem to relate to profiling and so that's why they're there basically. So what was surprising to me is that profiling seems to be enabled by default on some distributions and so that this stuff is actually statically linked into your program and all these little tiny pieces of assembly are put into your program without you knowing about it. So to check, um, to check what the default options are for GCC, you can have a look at, you know, GCC minus Q minus V will dump basically the list of compiler options that, um, that are done by default by GCC and you might find some stuff uh, interesting. So basically um, this work was done for, for GCC 4.4.5 which is pretty old um, and basically I looked for gadgets inside the code that was embedded by GCC into the target binary. So based on that, um, I kind of uh, so disassemble those functions and I end up with this, with this stuff to work with. So this basically is only generated by the compiler. It's not code which is generated by the target um, application. So you can see that I've got a bunch of, of stuff that I get to work with. Um, so the first one allows me to control EBX, so put a random value into there and, and control that. Um, the other one, leave, allows me to pivot the stack when I've achieved control and that I want to, you know, execute my shellcode in the end. And then the two others which are kind of the meat of the talk is that there is a, a, a write to memory. So basically if uh, through control of EBX I can write the value which is in EAX to EBX. So meaning that the value in the register I can dump it somewhere in, uh, in memory. 
And I've also got the other way around, uh, a right to registry, meaning that <coughs> a value by controlling EBX, I can grab a value from memory and load that in EBX. Okay, so that means that in short, you know, as an attacker, you control EBX and that's about it, right? So you have to find a way um, to achieve control of EAX also. Okay, so this, um, so basically the, the, the further part of the talk will just focus on those two instructions, on um, those two gadgets, um, and basically how, how I use them um, in order to achieve uh, a code execution. So basically we've got a, a useful gadget here which is um, add uh, memory to a register. I removed, you know, the trailing stuff and all that because it's not necessarily uh, interesting. So you control EBX so it means that you can grab a value in memory and load it into a register. Okay, is, is that useful? Well, you don't control what's in memory necessarily so, you know, it's, it's at first I didn't think it could be potentially useful but actually it is. Um, I'll come back to this later. So now the reverse basically, um, once I've got a value I'm interested in in a register, I can dump it into memory, right? So this allows me um, to create my fake uh, stack frame. So assuming that I control EAX, I can build uh, a fake stack frame, um, you know, at the address as pointed to by EB EBX. So that means that by chaining these, um, these calls, I can, you know, copy my shellcode um, into a frame I control and then, you know, trigger execution of it. So basically, um, as this is the more general approach to Rob, is that you're going to you're going to choose a spot in memory where you can build your stack. So, you know, the memory pro properties you want is that obviously you can write to it. And so with today's memory protection you can either execute or you can write. So you're going to choose a zone where you can write. If you look at the previous instruction it was an add instruction. So I have to find what is called a, a kind of a code cave which is a zone where, uh, which is just padded with null bytes. So just a bunch of zeros. So that way when I add it I just add to zero and I still get the same value I want. So it, it, it you know, it avoids like further computation. And then you choose the shell code you want. So just, you know, pick a shell code, anyone you want, um, you know, a set reg ID for bin SH or, you know, reverse shell code or whatever you want. And, and basically just, um, <coughs> just hope that you're going to, to copy that shell code to a frame you control and then execute it. So now the, the unusual approach I'd say to do this is that I chose to, um, deal, since I, I had to deal with arithmetic operations such as add, I chose to actually see the shellcode not as a string but as a number. And so basically if I, if I cut it into small pieces of 4 bytes on 32 bits and, and 8 bytes on 64, um, I just cut the shellcode into 4 byte chunks and then basically I interpret each chunk as an integer. So that just says basically take a string and it's, it's actually a number. And so if you keep track of each, um, of the index basically of each chunk, you know basically, you know, which index your number is. And what you want to do is since you're going to always be adding, you want to, them to be ordered because you always want to go from smaller to bigger. So basically you just all the order them. So you take your, your shell code, cut, cut it into little bits as numbers, and then basically um, you keep track of their position and you reorder them from smallest to biggest, right? And then once you've done that, you compute the difference between each chunks. So that will give you basically deltas between your pieces of shell codes and it will keep your shell code basically monotonically increasing, just meaning that each time you add a value to your register, it's going to always go up. So what this looks like if I take this example, so at the top you've got, um, you've got a shell code, right? Just a bunch, uh, just a string of, of, of hex. So if you take that as a number and reorder it, you get to line two basically. So if you see the end of the shellcode has been shifted back to the front and I've ordered all that together. All right, so they're ordered in increasing number. If you make, if you take the difference between each, basically you get, you get small deltas. So you see basically at the last line that position three of your initial shellcode is now at position one. Position two is actually, um, 
is actually 2 minus 3 and it's put at position 2 and etc. Right? So your, your shellcode is now um, represented as increasing deltas. So if you add, if you take your initial value and add the delta, you find back the value of your shellcode. You do that again, you find again the value, the next value of your shellcode, do that again, find the next value, etc. And once you've reached that value, you want to dump it to your fake stack, but you want to dump it in a way that um, you remember at wh which position it was initially, right? Otherwise, you're going to write it at the wrong spot. So once you do that, you just repeat, you repeat, you repeat, and then eventually you, you've copied what you want into a zone of memory. So as an example, say you want to copy the number 010234 uh, into memory. So <clears throat> you find that number in memory. So for the timing, I'm just assuming that it's there, right? I'll, I'll, I'll speak later on what happens if it's not. So basically you assume that the number's there in memory and you load the address of that and basically you copy that into EAX. So you've achieved uh, loading a value into a register from memory, right? So that was, that's kind of easy. Now you've got the value you want of your shellcode so you want to dump it onto your fake stack frame. So now if you look at that, that, that guy was actually at position number three so you actually drop it on the stack uh, at the right position. And now you're going to look for the next number which is, you know, the delta, um, which is in this case 040404 and so you assume that that also is in memory, you take it, you sum it and you get back to the same value and you dump it. And you do that over and over again and in the end basically you've achieved building a shellcode from a bunch of numbers that you found out in memory. So now it comes to the problem of how easy is it to find um, shellcode numbers in memories because Basically, if you, if you take your shellcode and look at it as a bunch of numbers, um, it's actually pretty uh, high numbers, right? It's, it's going to be, um, if you look at the example I've put there, 6A315899, if you take the string, I mean, without talking about what happens behind, but you just take the string and, you know, integer and two's complement and stuff, it actually ends up at 66A7C96, which is actually a pretty high number or negative number. But, we're relying here on the fact that that will be in memory and that we can copy it, right? What happens if it's not? So here, basically, the next, the next part is just, all right, um, I've got that value. Well, I'm hoping for that value to be in memory, but it's not. What can I do and how can I build it? So basically, the answer is it's that it's not it's not very easy to find big numbers in, uh, in memory. Uh, they're not, so I had to look at a bunch of programs and, and I saw that they're basically not really there. So, so here I put a small example of looking for, you know, 0102030304 in GDB and that it just doesn't, doesn't yield anything. If, if you look at multiple programs and search for those numbers, um, they're not really there. So I had to find basically a different approach. So the approach was, um, my idea was that if, if I can basically scan memory for numbers and if I can find a way to add them together to end up to that chunk value, then, then I'm fine, right? So by definition, memory, you know, has got a crazy number of, num of, of numbers in there, right? If, if you look at individual numbers, they've, they've got, it's got heaps of it in there. So the approach is basically take, um, take a file, take, you know, its read-only segment because, you, and basically just scan it for numbers, right? So just, you know, look at the, at the beginning of it, see it as a number, shift it by one byte, see it as a number, shift it as one byte and see it as another number. So you scan all that segment um, just looking for a bunch of numbers, right? So where I decided to look up for was basically in the read, read only segment because obviously you don't want those numbers to change at runtime. Here they come. Um, <clears throat> All right. So basically, yeah, I looked uh, inside the segments uh, which were read only so that basically I knew that at runtime those numbers would not change at all and excluded all the read-write segments um, basically which, which were going to change. 
So basically, if you don't have position independent code, the addresses are constant. Thank you very much. Show some love for our first time speaker at DEF CON. Thank you very much. Thank you too. What do you guys think of his graphics? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was just that was low. <laughs> That's all right. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically, yeah, the read-only segment, basically, to find your numbers. <laughs> so. What you do is scan that read only segment, look for the numbers, you know, shifting by one byte each time, and you keep track of their addresses, right? And so what you end up is with a whole bunch of numbers, and the pr problem seems pretty simple is that how do I add up, you know, these random bunch of numbers to find the chunk I want, right? So all you're looking for is finding the best combination of numbers which add up to a chunk. So this problem seems pretty simple because you know for a human like we do it all the time. But actually for a computer it's, it's pretty crap to get it to do that. And it's basically called uh, the coin change problem. So it took me a while to figure out that it actually was that what, is it, what I was looking for. So the example is really simple, right? You buy just an item at, you know, 425 euros and you give a 5 euro note. I'm from Europe, right? And, um, you know, what's the most efficient way to return change on that? You know, that's something we, we know how to do pretty easy. Um, you know, in Europe we'd give back a 50 cent coin, a 20 cent coin, and a 5 cent coin, right? So basically that's, that's the coin change problem is that what's the most efficient way of giving money back basically to someone who's paid you an item? And so basically if you look at this problem in dollars, the answer is different, right? You're looking for same thing, 75 uh, cents. So basically in the US you'd give a half dollar and a quarter. So you see that here the solution basically depends on your coin set and so it depends on the numbers you found in memory. So solving the, the problem for a human or for a cashier is something pretty, pretty simple. Solving the pr problem for a computer is a bit more dif difficult. So basically um, <clears throat> you can achieve an ideal solution uh, to the problem by using dynamic programming which basically will give you the most efficient solution. So, you know, maybe some of you guys have done that at high school. You know, it's, it's a pretty simple problem to solve when you've got small numbers. The problem is, um, since I'm dealing with pretty big numbers, is that dynamic programming doesn't scale and it just kind of blows my memory. So I can't get to scale it for massive numbers yet. So I had to use a different approach. So I used um, an approach called uh, the greedy approach, which is just slightly different, which basically achieves the same thing, but won't give you the optimal solution, right? It will give you a solution. And so how it works is that it's just really simple. It's just like, you, you know, you take the biggest coin which fits in the interval and then just add and add and add. And so one thing that we're kind of lucky with is that in numbers, you've got men in memory, sorry, you've got many, many small numbers, right? Uh, number one, two, three, four, five, all that is, you know, it's like you've got heaps of them in there. So basically um, you, you always can achieve the greedy approach, which is kind of nice, but it's suboptimal. So, kind of back, you know, to the 75 cent problem, um, looking, you know, sorry, with, uh, so, you know, trying to return 75 cents using the greedy approach, basically you just go down the list of your coins and take the biggest one which fits in. In this case, you know, 50 cents, 20 cents, and 5 cents. So, basically, all, all my tool does is that you know, you give it a number in memory, it will scan all memory, and it will try and find you the best solution for this. So basically I wrote a tool called ROPNUM, which basically is just trying to find you a solution to the coin change problem. So basically you give it a number, you give it a, uh, and it will basically throw you out all the addresses where those numbers added together end up with a chunk, right? So if you look at this back into the context of what I was talking before, here you're basically looking to add up a bunch of numbers in memory to reach a chunk of your shellcode, right? So this is what Rotterdam will do. It will give you basically that. Um, it's got a bunch of extra features, you know, can in your ignore null bytes, uh, you know, exclude numbers which you don't want in the coin change solver. 
it can print all memory address pointing to a number, pointing to zero, et cetera. I mean, all these features are basically not, not critical. They just make, you know, your exploit dev easier because you can exclude null byte addresses, you can exclude, uh, you know, addresses which are not in your range and et cetera. So an example usage is basically, um, find me the address of numbers, uh, in the segment containing the text section, so a read only section, which added together solve the coin change problem. So here if you look, you know, it will, it will spit out at the lower part, it spits out five numbers basically. And if you add those together, you get your target number, which is your, your shellcode chunk. So if we look back at this, basically, um, it's just, it will give you, yeah, the individual parts of the number which sum together get to your shellcode. Right, so here I just showed that if I re-add all the values together, I get, I get my initial value. So now coming back to my gadget, it's that here, by putting the value I want in EBX, um, and by adding repetitively, I can add the value, I can get to the value of my chunk. Okay, so if I put all this together, so basically, so you take your shellcode, you cut it, you order it, and you take the deltas. Um, you look for numbers in memory, and basically you add them together until you reach the value of a chunk, right? So here it means you've achieved, you've reached the value of, uh, of, of your shellcode. So once that chunk is reached, you basically just dump, dump it onto a stack frame you control. And you repeat that until the, the shellcode is complete, and in the end, you just transfer control over to your shellcode. So I, I wrote a tool also which automates all this process um, basically where you just give it a shell code and it will spit out some Python code to generate your payload explo exploit. <coughs> so what it does is basically you give it an input shell code, so anything you want, you give it a frame address, so where you want to copy your data to, right, which will generally be the, the data section. It takes care of all the boring details, right, which, which uh, make your life hell, so indianness, you know, two's complement, padding, blah, blah, blah. And it will spit out a bunch of Python code which generates your payload. So if you're familiar, you know, with all the CTF tools, you know, ROP gadget, all that stuff, um, it does something pretty similar to that. Now what it does also is that, you know, for the timing we've copied um, our payload to a fake stack we've got, but that, that stack is read-write for the timing, right? So what, what the tool will do is that it will add a small uh, mProtect uh, read-write stub frame before your payload. So what it does is that basically it will allow your, to change the memory permissions at runtime so that your shellcode can run. And so it's got a bunch of additional functions, you know, like it can start with, uh, you know, an arbitrary EX value and it can look up numbers in sections or segments depending on what you want to do and, and all that kind of stuff. So a bit more on why you need an mProtect stub, basically. So you've copied your shellcode into a zone of memory which is read-write, right? So if you return uh, execution to that, it's not going to be able to execute, right? Um, you're just going to get a, a fault from your processor because the memory permissions are wrong. So you need to make that page kind of read execute or read write execute at runtime. So this is where mprotect kicks in. It's just, you know, a standard Linux um, libc function, sorry, which allows you to change memory permissions at runtime. So basically I just add a small mprotect stub in the front of that and once that has executed it will jump back into your, into your shellcode. So an example usage is basically, you know, to copy a BinSH shellcode to a fake frame located, lo located in the data section, putting an mprotect frame and looking up segments in the read-only segment in, in a binary, you end up basically with, uh, with this, this command. And so all this basically will spit you out uh, a bunch of Python code which, um, yeah, which will just uh, once run will basically generate your, your shellcode. So I didn't put I didn't put the output on the slides because it's um, it's pretty verbose and it's it's just a lot of bunch of, of code, which isn't very interesting. Um, I put it on the CD though, and I've got an example on GitHub if if you want to have a look at it. So if we have a look at, at GDB at what hap what's happening inside GDB, basically, um, you'll see that I put the values in yellow. They're the values which are basically being copied. So if you look at those values, the first one basically 0x7 is, is a read, write, execute for the mprotect frame. And so basically that one is written 
um, you know, at, at its proper index. The next one is 0x80, right, which is, which is the interrupt number. And you'll see that that guy is written completely at the end of the stuff. So this kind of shows, um, you know, the tracking of the index and, and, you know, where stuff has to go to rebuild your shellcode. And so then I write 0x1000, which is the next, you know, biggest number on, on the, on the shellcode, and it will write it back, you know, at a different index, et cetera, et cetera. So if you continue that, you know, the, the, um, you continue that execution 10 times, you know, just to, just to see it go, go a bit faster, um, you'll see that there's a bunch of missing zones in orange, basically, which, which will be filled in later. So it's just, this is just kind of to show that the shellcode is built kind of out of order. And so the end, end shellcode is basically, um, your shellcode is complete in memory with a, a read, write, execute, um, mprotect stub just before it. So there's a bunch of pros and cons to this technique. Um, I don't know, I was wondering about this and et cetera, if it's got a real use case scenario. Um, it's just something I wandered around with and I found it nice, but I don't know if it's actually useful in real life. Um, it's got a bunch of pros though, it's that it can encode any shellcode. You don't have a null byte problem because basically all you're dealing with is addresses, right? You never actually um, look for values. And you never pop values into registers, just addresses. The lower two bytes of your address um, are controlled, basically, and so you can exclude those values if you don't want them in your addresses. And obviously, the, you know, the initial goal was that you're not affected by railroad, SLR, or X or W. So basically, it will allow you, you know, to, to bypass all those memory protections. The cons, basically, is that the payloads are fairly large, right, because you're generating um, you're ad adding, you know, multiple values, right, to reach a value of a chunk. So up to, you know, five values together. So that requires quite a bit of um, iterations to get there. So what that means is that those iterations, they transform into, you know, a code length, basically. So your payload grows. So your stage zero can get pretty big. So that's a pretty, you know, um, pretty big con. So the further usage to this is that Let's imagine that, you know, here we were looking at EAX, here I'm still looking at, you know, the specific case of GCC 4.4.5 is that uh, um, I achieved control of EAX through, you know, through this technique. But basically one thing I had is that sometimes EAX, the initial value you've got in there changes depending on, you know, on your user input data. So one nice trick is that if, if you control EAX is that you can more or less get a value you want into there um, through during just a random function call in, in, in uh, the PLT. And since, you know, in the Linux uh, SD call ABI, um, EAX holds the return value of, of a function call. So basically if you do any random function call and make it fail or succeed or whatever, you can kind of control the initial value you've got in there. So now I tried to take an approach to shrink the, the, the size basically of the stage zero. So one approach was basically that instead of loading the whole shellcode in memory, what I could do is just create some kind of gadget table, right, at the location I wanted. So instead of taking the whole thing, you know, the whole shellcode, which is, you know, a big number of bytes and just ditching it there, what I can do is instead of that, load a bunch of additional gadgets and use that as a table uh, to further continue my exploit. So for example, say that, you know, you've got your exploit and you'd like to have those uh, gadgets I put in there, right? Um, it's the opcodes I put on the right. So basically your shellcode becomes, you know, 59C3, 5B, blah, 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 blah. So if you load that, you know, you use number stitching, you know, and, and rop stitch to generate that and put that in memory, then you can actually call them directly from, you know, from a stage zero payload or from your, from your payload. And so that way you can kind of insert additional gadgets within the target's memory space. Um, which is kind of practical. And so, yeah, since, you know, the tool can change your memory permissions, you know, it's, it, it will work. And then you just call the gadgets from your table or it doesn't have to be necessary gadgets, it can just be bytes, right? You can just add a bunch of bytes there and it, it increases kind of your available availability of your bytes. And so, yeah, you have kind of the ability to load um, any gadget or byte in memory just using a bunch of memory addresses. Um, I haven't automated that part in the tool yet. It's just, it's just kind of, um, yeah, on the side. 
So future work. Um, so basically, I'd like to you know continue having a bit of a look on on numbers and basically if if they're available to memory and you know not subject to SLR. Um, so check a bunch of bin binaries with PIE, see if I can figure out if anything comes up. You know, realistically, there shouldn't be, but you know, you never know. Maybe something will come up. Um, and basically, search for gadgets in uh, new versions of libc and GCC. So <clears throat> it seems difficult, but you know, I might find a bunch of gadgets in there which could be exploitable, and you know, allow to have that separation, basically, of you know, exploiting the program through through its kind of uh, dependencies in a way. Um, and on the tooling side, basically, I'd like to get a dynamic programming approach to work with large numbers. Um, I don't think it will be completely possible, um, but I'll have a look into it. Um, to add 64 bit support, I mean, here, regarding the metho methodology, it's pretty simple, right? The numbers are just bigger, so it doesn't change anything. Uh, the problem is, will be with the mProtect uh, stack frame, which might be harder to, to introduce. And I think basically that there'd be an advantage in introducing a kind of mixed approach. So, you know, possibly integrating this in other tools which already do their job really well. So, you know, um, you know, Rob Gadget can generate a payload once it's got everything from, you know, from a string. But like maybe try and automate finding the missing bytes basically using this technique, which means that you'd have a proper, a real um, automatic payload generation. Um, you know, that's obviously if they're interested. And basically, I'd like to also introduce, you know, the in the tool, basically, the concept of, you know, gadget tables and, you know, introducing random bytes at random addresses. So just, you know, to summarize what I wanted to do was basically, you know, to achieve exploitation without using gadgets from the target binary but from, you know, stuff introduced by the environment. That took me down the track, you know, giving me those two particular gadgets that took me down the track of, of you know, having to kind of scan memory for numbers and find ways to add them together to achieve what I wanted. Um, so if you want to have a chat about it or if you've got any ideas or if you think this is useful or not, just shoot me an email. Um, yeah, and if you want to try out the tool, uh, it's available on GitHub, so give it a shot. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for listening through this and have a good DEF CON. Cheers. <laughs>